Anyway, so <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2, the, the passage that I really want you to see here is that famous verse in verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And what I want to preach about this morning is, is how to study the Bible. So I want, to, I want to explain to you how I study the Bible and just maybe give you some tips as far as how you go into that. Because I think a lot of times, especially those that are new to the Bible or reading the Bible, um, it's daunting. You know, where do you start? What do you, you know, what do you do? Um, you know, it's a big book. Okay, and so um, I just want to give some tips on that as far as just uh, what I do and, and how I do it. Um, and so, uh, but the first thing to realize is that God wants us to study the Bible, and it's very important that we do. And so, this verse is very clear of that. And verse 16 is really kind of the big reason why, right? Because it says, But, sh but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more godliness, ungodliness. And so, why do, why do we need to study to show ourselves approved? Because there's vain babblings, there's vain janglings, there's a bunch of doctrines of devils that are out there. And so we need to understand good doctrine, good sound doctrine, but the way that you're going to do that is by studying the Word of God. Okay, and so Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 28 kind of has a, a you know an idea too is that um, you know at Proverbs 15 verse 28 I think of this when I when I think of Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 because we're not just studying just so that we have a whole bunch of knowledge and you know the the, the reason to study and to have a bunch of knowledge is to use it and so um, in Proverbs 15 verse 28. It says, the, the heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. So, you know, we're supposed to be trying to study to answer, you know, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So, we need to be ready always to give an answer, but in order to give an answer, you have to study to, to get that answer, right? And so, but the first thing that I want to get across is... The first step to studying is reading the Bible a lot. Okay? If you haven't read through the Bible cover to cover, just work on that. Okay? Before you get into some deep study on different doctrines and stuff like that, and obviously come to church and you know hear good preaching and listen to good preaching on doctrine, and you can learn a lot that way too. But don't try to dig deep into the Bible if you've never read through the Bible cover to cover. Okay, you need to see the big picture. And honestly, um, I know some pastors have said this, and you know, I, I think there's some truth to that. You know, you don't really, you shouldn't really d be diving deep into into the, the deep things of God until you've probably read through the Bible five times. Now, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that like, you read it through one time and you're like, I want to study out this doctrine, and be like, no, that's off limits. I can't do that. I'm not saying that. All that, all that means is that you're going to be more equipped to go into that study if you've read through the Bible at least more than once, okay? But if you haven't read through the Bible once, and listen, I was there. When I got saved, it took me a long time to get through it one, one time. I'm just going to be honest with you. That first time is the hardest time, and it takes you the longest to get through that first time. And so it, you just got to think to yourself, once you get through that first time, it's going to be easier the second time. It's going to be easier the third time. It's going to be easier the fourth time, right? And so that first time, it took me years. I'm just going to be honest with you. And now I read through the New Testament probably more than once by, by the time I finally got through the Old Testament and all that stuff. But it takes a long time to get through it. But you shouldn't dive in. And I did. I tried diving into all these you know, deep doctrines and trying to figure out things. But you know what? I was missing a lot of information going into that study because I hadn't read it. So the first thing we need to realize is that we need to read. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. I mean, why do we read a whole chapter here at Mountain Baptist Church every service? Sometimes a chapter, there's one verse I'm trying to get to, right? There's one, one idea, and, there, and there's chapters that have like, you know, five different parables in it. And I'm talking about one parable, but we'll read the whole chapter. Why? Because it's important to read the Bible. And you need to be reading the Bible every day. And I believe, you know, as a pastor, I try to get through the Bible at least four times a year. Yeah, that's minimum. That's a, being a pastor, okay? But I think that a church member should be striving to get through the Bible once a year. Once a year, I think that's doable. You obviously need to get a schedule. You need to be, you know, persistent at it. But if you're going through it in, once in a year, let me tell you this. If, you, if you've read through the Bible once, you beat most Christians. That's the sad truth. 
right? The sad truth is that if you've read through the Bible one time, you beat most Christians. You're in the min you're in the minority of Christians. And but the problem is, is that you have a bunch of Christians who's never read through the Bible, a bunch of pastors that's never read through the Bible cover to cover, but yet they're going to come out and, and talk about doctrine. They're going to come out and talk about all the, the deep truths and tell someone why they're wrong on a subject when they never even read through the Bible cover to cover. They just listen to a whole bunch of sermons, listen to a whole bunch of YouTube videos. Okay, And that's why you get a lot of people on YouTube that think they know what they're talking about when it comes to the Bible, but they don't know the Bible from a hole in the ground. And so, uh, the first key is to, to, to read. Now, notice what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. The one thing I see in 1, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy is doctrine, 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 doctrine. Right? Is that that's what you need to have, right? That, that we need, and, and preaching the word, reading the Bible, give attendance to reading. So if, if you're a new Christian or, or if you're just someone that, you know, you're just like, I'm just trying to get through the Bible one time, just work on that. Okay? Don't worry about getting into the, the study aspect until you've read through the Bible a lot. That doesn't mean that you can't come to church and learn some doctrine because the word is manifested through preaching. So, uh, but it's, I don't want to say it's dangerous, but you can fall into some rabbit holes. You can fall into to false ideas if you're not, if you don't have the Bible, uh, kind of the whole Bible at your disposal as far as in your mind. Okay? So the more you read it, the easier the studying is going to be. Because a lot of people ask me, you know, like how, you know, how do you pr preach three sermons, uh, you know, a week? And how do you come up with ideas? And how, how do you write those sermons, you know, for an hour, you know, well, hour, you know, that's, that's relative. It depends on how long I preach. But here's the thing. It's because I've read the Bible a lot before I got to this position. Okay? So when I study out, when I study out a subject, I've already got verses all over the place in my mind that I'm thinking about and just different things that I'm thinking about. So I'm not like, it's not a big job to try to figure out where am I going to go to prove this point. Now obviously there's still study. It's not like I know everything. It's not like everything's on the tip of my mind all the time. So obviously there's study and then, you know, uh, that, that I'll give you an example that that sermon, uh, the only begotten and the first begotten, there was, there was verses the morning of the sermon that I saw, I'm like, that fits perfectly. I never even thought of that as far as being applicable to that. And so uh, I'm not saying that I know everything or that it's always on top of my mind, but the more you read, the easier it's going to be. And so if you don't, if you never read through the Bible once, you're going to, you're going to be starting off with a disadvantage. So, uh, but just some other verses on that. I mean, you think of, uh, Deuteronomy 8, and this is, this is um, quoted in the New Testament, Jesus quotes this, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, that's, that's what we're, we're if, you eat, if you eat every day, okay, which most of us do, right? We eat every day and more than once a day, then that's the way we should be reading the Bible. That's the way we should be looking at what God has said in the Word of God. Uh, Job 23 and verse, verse 12, it says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So that's the attitude you should have with the word of God, first of all, is when you're reading it, it should be more so than the necessary food. And you say, well, you know, I don't have time. Wake up before you eat breakfast and read the Bible. And, you know, may, maybe tell yourself, hey, I'm not going to eat breakfast until I do read the Bible. And that'll give you motivation, <laughs> okay? You're like, I'm hungry, so I need to, I need to uh, read the Bible. Uh, and the thing is, you may say, well, I don't feel like reading the Bible. Well, you know, sometimes, a lot of times, if you just start reading it, you get hungry to, to read it. You know, you start reading, you're like, oh, this is interesting. And, and, and sometimes you don't, you, you don't feel like it until you get into it, and then, you're, then you don't want to stop, you know? And so, but, uh, but jo Joshua 1.8 it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Psalm 1 and verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And so when we're reading the Bible, you know, there's obviously the aspect of meditating on it, chewing on it, memorizing it. So when you're studying the Bible, and you're going to study out a certain doctrine or whatever, do you know what helps you a lot is if you have verses memorized? Right? You not only know, like, hey, I know there's a verse in there that says that, you know it off the top of your head, right? 
And so this helps you out soul winning, obviously. You know, if you have verses on top of your head and you have it memorized, that helps you. But at least if you know where it's at, you know, you can just turn to it. But it's obviously better to have it memorized, better to have it on your mind. Because when you're going through, you know, uh, a lot of the books that I have memorized are in the New Testament. When I go back to the Old Testament and I'm reading some obscure passages, you know what's in the back of my mind? It's almost like you have this, this thesaurus, so to speak, of Bible and words in the Bible that are at your disposal. So when you're reading the Bible, there's like these key words that you hear. You know, and you're just like, wow, I, I know that's in the, I know that's in this passage over here. I wonder if there's a link between that. Okay, and so uh, this is really just pre preparation to study, right? If if uh, if you're lacking on your Bible reading, you just need to stick on your Bible reading. Okay, uh, the Bible does say to study to show thyself approved unto God, but you really need to focus on the reading first. And even after you've read through the Bible, you know, you know one time, five times, ten times. Don't neglect the reading, okay? Don't think, okay, I've read through the Bible ten times, therefore, you know, it's just study now. No, no, you need to always be giving attendance to reading. And, you know, even as a pastor, even though I've read through the Bible many times, I still, you know, have that where I'm going to be reading at least four times a year because I'm going to forget things. And you need to constantly be having that on your mind. I need to be eating the Word of God like it's my necessary food. And then when I go to the study, it's all kind of fresh in your mind. So it's not hard. It's not that hard to come up with sermons. But it also is going to keep you from these, these profane and vain babblings. Because you're going to have it all in your mind. You're going to be like, no, that's not right because this verse over here says this. How does that fit? Right? And so... Um, but also, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, the doctors of the law, all the scribes. And what was the one main, main thing that he said to them? Have you not read? Have you not read? I mean, Matthew 12, he says that to them twice, and he gives two examples of passages saying, Have ye not read? You do greatly err not knowing the Scriptures, right? So these people are supposed to be those that are doctors of the law. And they're supposed to be people that know the Bible and study the Bible day in, day out, but yet they haven't even read it. That's what he was saying. Is basically, you haven't even read it. You don't know it. But you're going to study it, and you're going you're gonna to have all these doctrines set up of stuff you don't even, you've never even read. Okay? And so Bible college is very notorious for this, where people get out of Bible college, they think they're an expert on, on Bible doctrine, they have a master's in theology, but they never read through their Bible one time, I hate to break it to you, but you're not even close to even, I mean, this church right here probably knows more Bible and read through more Bible than most of the pastors that are in, in the world today. You know, that, that's sad because you need leaders that actually read the Bible and know the Bible to teach you doctrine. And so they don't take you down a wrong path because they haven't read. And so the first step to studying the Bible is reading it a lot. Just keep reading it, reading it, reading it, reading it, reading it. And, you know, go to the point where you're just like, I, I think I can study this, but I'm going to read a little more, you know, just to make sure, you know, I'm still on, I'm, I'm doing that first step. The second step is you want to make sure you have foundational doctrines that are not up for debate. Okay? This is a big problem, even in Baptist churches and people that are saved, where they basically say everything's up for grabs. You know, every doctrine's up for grabs, therefore I'm going into the Bible with just, you know, anything can go. That's a problem. Because, you know, the Bible the Bible is very clear that there's certain foundational truths that, that don't move. You know, you're not you're not gonna if you go into the Bible, I, I, you know, the example I'm gonna give you is uh, you know, salvation. If you go into the Bible thinking salvation's up for grabs, you're gonna be off in the weeds very quickly. Because every time saved is brought up, or every time something about you know, condemnation or damnation comes up, you're automatically thinking this is talking about going to hell or going to heaven, and therefore you're going to be all over the place, and you're going to think everything's a paradox. Okay? And so the, the key is having foundational doctrines that don't move and that aren't up for debate. Okay? Uh, Psalm 11. Go to Psalm 11, verse 3. Psalm 11, verse 3. I think this is a big issue when it comes to why people get off in false doctrine because if they had a foundation that they, they were saying this isn't moving, 
then when they get to troubling passages, they're not going to just go off the rails. They're just going to say, I don't either, I, either I don't know how to answer this right now, or I'm going to study to figure out how to answer this. Right? And so, uh, Psalm 11, in verse 3, it says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And there's foundations that are in doctrine that you need to keep clear and don't let those be moved. So when you get into certain passages that are really hard, then don't let that be moved. Go to Matthew chapter 16. I'll give you, I'll give you a foundational truth, a foundational doctrine that should never move. No matter what you read or no matter a passage that may look different to you, or may, may seem to say something to the contrary, you hold on to the foundation and don't let that go. And if you can't figure it out when you're sitting there, that's fine. But you don't destroy the foundation. In Matthew 16, verse 16, it says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When he said that, upon this rock shall I build my church, what was that? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the rock, that's the foundation. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, talking about the judgment seat of Christ, who's the foundation? Who's the foundation? There is no other foundation laid than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. He's the rock. And the fact that Jesus is the Christ and that He is the Son of God is the main foundation. Nothing should ever move that foundation. And anytime you have a doctrine that would try to move that, you should throw it out. And so, you know, you think of like Sam Gipp saying that, the, that Jesus isn't the Messiah, which is Christ, by the way. And you, you have that, what, do you, what did he do? He destroyed the foundation. He destroyed the foundation because of his Zionism, because of his Jew worship. And then you got modalism that says, well, Jesus isn't the son of, you know, he, he wasn't always the son. What are you doing? You're destroying the foundation of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and the fact that Jesus is the son of God. Not just a man, but he's the son of God, which means he's God. And they're destroying the foundation based off some other doctrine. They went into that. The modalists went into that thinking, okay, you know, this is all up for grabs. No foundation. You know, when I go into the Trinity, you know, with the, with the Trinity, there's a foundation. There's three persons, one God. And if there's a verse that would say contrary to that or seem to say contrary to that I'm not throwing out the foundation I'm going to figure out how that fits with the foundation but that's why people have problems studying the Bible is because they don't have any foundation they say well you're going in with a preconceived idea you're, you're right I am you better believe I am you think I, I'm not going into the Bible with a preconceived idea that salvation is by, by grace through faith you're, you're kidding yourself if you think that no one has a preconceived idea going into the Bible. Because you better have a preconceived idea. You better have some knowledge. You better have read the Bible at least some before you go into it. And you better have some foundational doctrines that don't move. Salvation, right? The, the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the rock that the church was built on. But yet they're trying to destroy the foundations. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, it, the... And you say, well, you know, is that a big deal? You know, when they say he's not always the son. Yeah, it's a big deal. Have, listen to my sermon on the only begotten and the first begotten. And, you know, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 says that, But unto the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The Son is God. And that means the Son of God is deity. And when you say that the Son just came into being, you're saying that that deity came into being. And there's many other ways to, to, to prove that. Salvation by, by, by faith. Uh, you know, notice, notice in, in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Notice what Jesus says to Nicodemus. And sometimes we don't really focus on this part of it. But, you know, the famous passage of, of you must be born again. Notice in verse 7. 
So John chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? <clears throat> and notice what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I, if I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And isn't that the truth? Nicodemus didn't understand salvation, but he was a ruler in Israel. He didn't have the foundations, and Jesus, Jesus is rebuking him for that. He's like, how can these things be? And he's like, you're a master of Israel and you don't know these things? And so, when you're going into the, to the Bible and to studying the Bible, these guys are all studying the Bible. They don't even have the foundations right. You know, when it comes to being born of God, what, what, is, what do you have to do to be born of God? Believe. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, according to 1 John 5, 1. And obviously, if you went to John 1, verse 12, it says, that As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so he missed the very foundations of his doctrine. So when you go into all the other doctrines, if you go into the Bible not understanding salvation, good luck. Because you're going to be down every rabbit hole. You're going to come out with all these this profane and vain babblings, all these false doctrines. And you're going to be tossing to and fro to every wind of doctrine. And so you have to have salvation done. You have to have who Jesus is, that he's God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have to understand who Jesus is. If you don't understand the Godhead and you don't understand the fact that God is three persons, then going into a Bible study, you're going to be off the rails. And if you say that's up for debate and say, well, we need to figure out, you know, we have all these passages that kind of seem like, you know, it, it's saying that, you know, that's not true, or, or, you know, this oneness stuff, or, you know, then you're going to be off the rails. And, and you say, well, you're wanting to have a preconceived idea. Yes, I am. Yes, I am, because it's a foundation. It's a foundational doctrine. It doesn't move. Just as much as salvation doesn't move. I'm not going to go into salvation and go into passages and be like, well, salvation's up to debate. I guess James 2 can mean that we can lose our salvation. I guess Acts 2.38 says we have to be baptized. You know, I guess all these passages that people are always trying to pull out mean this and that. You know, no, you have a rock that doesn't move. Therefore, you interpret those passages based off the foundation. And then you find out that the foundation obviously is right and that there's good explanations. There's good, you know, teaching as far as what those passages are talking about. But if you're saved, if you just get saved and you go into the Bible and you say salvation's up for grabs, it's just not going to work. But if you just get saved and go into the Bible, you're going to find a lot of passages that are going to seem to contradict. They're going to look like they contradict salvation by grace through faith. But obviously they don't. How about this? The Word of God is without error. The Word of God is without error. Anybody that's going into studying the Bible and they don't believe they have a perfect Word of God, they're not King James only, unless they speak Greek and Hebrew, which most of these people don't, by the way, and they're using that, the right text on top of that. But if you go into the Bible thinking there's errors in it, you're going to have false doctrines. Period. Because you're going to look at a passage and say, that doesn't look right, I need to fix it. And therefore you're going to come out with false doctrines because the King James Bible is actually right. And what you need to realize is that this is the foundation. I need to, I need to fit to that foundation. I need to, to circumvent to where that foundation is and not veer off. That's the rock. You're holding on to it. I have set the Lord always before me because, because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. And if you had the rock of the Word of God, you had the rock of these foundational uh, doctrines, then you're not going to be moved off on these, these, these strange doctrines. These, these doc you're not going to be tossed to and fro. You're holding on to the foundation. And so, uh, you know, uh, famous verses on the Word of God, you know, in, in Psalm 12, verse 6, it says, the, word, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, you know, what we need to realize is that God's Word's perfect. There's no, there's no error in it. 
And you may look at a passage and be like, that looks like a contradiction. Well, you're wrong. That's, that's just the, the fact of the matter. You're wrong. The Bible's right. You're wrong. You need to figure out why it works. But in Psalm 19, Psalm 19, in verse 7 there, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. The Bible is incorruptible. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it talks about the fact of being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's inspired, it's preserved, and it's incorruptible. So people that go into the Bible and they'll look at Leviticus chapter 20, or they'll look at some passage that they don't like to hear, and they say, I don't want to agree with that. You're wrong. The Bible's right. The Bible's right, the Bible's pure, the Bible's perfect, and you need to hold on to the rock and not veer off and try to explain away passages in the Bible. We're not trying to explain away things, but you can't, you can't have verses that are opposite. You can't, have th you, can't have, you can't have salvation by faith and salvation by works in the same Bible. Period. So you can't have you know, the Trinity and oneness in the same Bible. They can't both be there. And so, but if you have, if you go into it holding on to this rock that this is true, that there are three to bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and that you understand that that's talking about one God, that the Father isn't the Son, the Son isn't the Holy Spirit, that there are three distinct persons with three distinct wills, you understand that if you read John 14, and you read through the book of John, that they're not the same person, but they're one God. You may not completely comprehend it. You may not completely have an answer to every single passage that someone's going to throw at you. But you hold on to the rock. And then you figure it out. Okay? I'm not saying you have to have the answer to every passage. None of us have the answer to every single passage in the Bible. We're still learning. There's still verses out there that are just, you know, I'm not sure exactly what it's saying. But I'll know one thing. It doesn't say that we, have to, that we can lose our salvation. You know what I mean? I, I, know, I, know, I know it's not saying I have to do good works to go to heaven. I know it's not saying that Jesus isn't the Son of God. I know it's saying that Jesus isn't the Christ. I know it's, it's, not, say, it's not the fact that the Bible has error in it. So, And it's not the fact that God is wrong. Do you have any foundational truths that you're going to hold on to and say, that's, that's untouchable? So, how about the fact that God can't lie? Is that untouchable or not? So, there's certain truths that are untouchable, and we need to realize that going into the Bible study. And so, you got to get that established first before you go into it or you're going to get off the rails. Now, I'm going to give you some tips on, on just what I use and what I do for Bible study. First of all, get yourself a Bible search engine, okay? I use eSword, okay? eSword, and, and on my phone, since it's an Apple, they don't have eSword on there. Um, so, I, I use this Mantis app or whatever. But there's all kinds of Bible apps. The good thing about Bible apps is the King James is always free. Because there's no copyright. If you have to buy, if you have, if you want other versions, then you have to to buy it. And by the way, if you want to see what the other versions say, just go to BibleGateway.com. And so there's all kinds of sites that you can go to to search up Bible verses. But eSword's free. Just download it, and you know it's a great app to figure out. Uh, you know if you want to, if you're trying to figure out a verse, you're like, I know it said this. I know it kind of said had these words in it, and you can just type that in. It'll give you all the verses that have those words in it. And so it's a great tool, okay? Now, it's become a crutch, I think, for people that don't read the Bible, okay? So don't, don't, don't use eSword and say, well, I don't need the Bible anymore. I can just search up things and figure it out that way. Now, this is, this is complimentary. This is something that you should be going to after you're reading the Bible and all this other stuff. And so use that to, to find passages that you kind of remember a little bit about, but you're trying to find it. Here's why that doesn't always work. Because there's things in the Bible that aren't worded exactly the same. And so, even like New Testament, it'll say something, you know, quoting back from the Old Testament, but it's not worded exactly the same. So, you may have problems trying to find it. Because just that verse I gave you about Deuteronomy, it says the word of the Lord, and then the New Testament says the word of God. Okay, so if you, put, if you type in what it says in the New Testament, you're not going to find it. 
because it says it a little differently, okay? But if you know, <laughs> you know, the fact of, you know, where that's located, you can find it. So find yourself a search engine like that. That's going to help you uh, to figure out, you know, some passages trying to find. You know, you can just type in grace and you'll find all the places to say grace. Salvation, saved. You know, stuff like that. So uh, that's what I use. And a lot of times I use it just because it's easier to just copy and paste verses. You know, so my, my sermon's typed out. I don't type out all these verses, okay? This is copying and pasting from, from eSword, okay? Because that would take me forever <laughs> to do all that, to type it all out. And I'd probably make more, I'd make mistakes, to be honest, typing and all that stuff. So that's a great tool. You know, once you once you realize, okay, I'm I'm reading my Bible, I'm reading consistently, I'm I'm at least getting through it once in a year. Okay, now I have foundational doctrines that don't move. You know, the fact that the Word of God is pure. And you go into the Bible, you go into studying the Bible, realizing that this doesn't have an error. You're gonna you're gonna have good doctrine because this is your foundation, not you. When you say there's errors in it, now you're the foundation. Now you're God. Now you're the one that's making up what's right and what's wrong. And so, I believe God blesses those that hold to the... You, you want to know why King James Only Bible churches have good doctrine, have sound doctrine, that go soul winning, do what they need to do, because they actually believe that this is perfect. And they don't just have a doctrine just because that's what they want it to have. And I'm not saying, all, I'm not saying Baptist churches are perfect, or people don't have bad doctrine too, because, you know, because they looked at it wrong or whatever. But you have to have that foundation, now, I'm going to give you an example of, like, let's say you were wanting to study a topic, okay? And let's say you're just like, I want to study on the rapture, okay? Number one thing that I do when, I study, when I'm, like, going to study a doctrine or a topic is I, I, I find the passage that's the most famous passage dealing with that subject. I don't start off in an obscure passage, okay? So if I'm going to go, let's say I'm going to do a sermon on the rapture. Where, where, where's the number one place I'm going to go? First Thessalonians chapter 4. It's the number one rapid rapture passage in the Bible. So I'm going to start there. And since I'm already in 1 Thessalonians, I'm probably going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because it talks about the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto Him. So, but then I'm going to go to all the passages dealing with the coming of the Lord. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, you know, Revelation 6, 7, Revelation 14. And you say, well, I don't believe those are the rapture. Well, after you get done with those passages, you'll realize that's the rapture. <laughs> okay, so... But that's, that's beside the point, is the fact that, you know, I'm going to go to the most famous passages. I'm going to deal with those passages. That's going to be my, my rock, so to speak, in, in my doctrine. Then I'm going to branch out and start figuring out, okay, what else applies here? And I'm going to make it fit the clear statements, the clear passages. And I'm, then, I, you know, after I get, you know, all the other pieces of other passages that aren't all about the rapture or all about the coming of the Lord, then I may go into, okay, what... What's some sim symbol, you know, some parables, right? How parables will line up to it, or how you know, uh, you know, you got the symbology of it, or the feast of the Lord, right? And that's definitely there's some def definite uh, truths to the coming of the Lord in the feast of the Lord, but you don't start there. Does that make sense? You don't start with symbology. You don't start with you know, well, this is in the Old Testament. You're starting out in Daniel. No, that's not where you start. Now, is the rapture in Daniel? Yes. But that's not where you start. You start with the most clear. And by the way, the New Testament is going to be the most clear. So any doctrine that you're, you're wanting to, to teach on or think about, you, you start off in the New Testament. Okay? Start off in the New Testament, work your way back to the Old Testament, and work your way out into the, the, the harder passages or the more unclear passages. People go the opposite route. That's why you get into false doctrine. Zionism, what do they do? Start in the Old Testament. Why would you do that? The New Testament's more clear. Amen. I mean, Jesus Christ, you know, they, they saw through a glass darkly. At least, I mean, we're a little more clear, even though we are still looking through a glass darkly. But they had the prophets and all that stuff. We had Jesus Christ. We had the Son of God teaching us the Bible. Amen. Why would you start off back there? And so, that's a big red flag. Start off in the New Testament. And then work your way back. Okay, and there's definitely a lot of things that you can learn in the Old Testament and things that will add on to that. But, you know, don't go the other way around. So, what about when you're dealing with a questionable verse, right? Well, first thing, first, when you're dealing with it, let's say you find a verse and you're like, man, what is that talking about? 
You know, that seems like it contradicts what I believe on salvation or, or whatever topic, baptism or whatever. Read the whole chapter. Get context. If you have to, read the whole book. Okay? Now, sometimes this is more difficult because you're dealing with maybe like a psalm, right? <laughs> or you're dealing with Proverbs and it's like, it's not like a whole story. So it's just like one little verse. And so it's harder to get context. But most of the time you're dealing with the fact that it's a story and it's telling you all this stuff. So read, the whole read the whole chapter. Better yet, read the whole book. Get the whole picture. Realize who he's talking to, what he's talking about, what is he trying to get across before you go into that. Um, try to look for parallel passages. Parallel passages like the fact that there's four Gospels. Okay, so in four Gospels, you have parallel passages a lot of times in those, in those places. Sometimes you don't, right? Sometimes there's a story that's only in Luke or only in John, right? But parallel passages will help you out. Like Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, those are all parallel passages. Second uh, Peter chapter 2 and, Luke, and, and Jude, those are parallel passages. Ephesians and Colossians are parallel books, right? And even 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are parallel books. There's a lot of things that are, that are mentioned again in those books. And so those type of things will help you. To, uh, you have a troubling passage. Well, go to the parallel passage and see if it gives you a little more light. Right? Even words in the Bible where it talks about Anon. They received Anon, anon with, with joy, right? The, the word. Well, another passage says immediately. Well, you already know, well, what's Anon mean? Immediately. So a lot of times that will help you understand the Bible. But what about, let's just give you an example, okay? Well, let's say a troubling passage, James chapter 2. Go to James chapter 2. I'm going to give you an example of how to do this. So again, when you're going into just like a topic or, you know, a certain main doctrine you're trying to look into, go to the most famous passage. Go to the clearest passage. Go to the statements that are made by Jesus Christ. You know, that, that, those are the types of things and, you know, that you want to grasp onto and then move out from there. When you're dealing with a troubling passage, you want to get context or a, you know, a troubling verse or whatever, a uh, questionable verse. So James chapter 2 and verse 14, let's just read, let's just read this one verse here. It says, What doth a prophet, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? And people pull this out of context, we'll put it on a shelf, and they read that off and say, faith can't save somebody. It's I got to have works too. And they apply it to eternal salvation. Right? And then they'll go to verse 17 where it says, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. You're dead in trespasses and sins if you don't have works. Right? Do you see how they do that though? But you're ripping it out of context. You're not seeing what it's talking about. Now the funny part about this is, you know, well, first of all, before, even before you get into that, okay, you get in the context. Remember, what's our foundation? Foundation is that we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, right? So that automatically should put up this wall like, well, it can't be that, right? Because you have Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift to God, not of works, as any man should boast. That's a clear statement. This is a question in James chapter 2. How about the fact that Romans 3, 28 says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You know, not to mention all of Romans chapter 4, right? But the him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans eleven six, and if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So you have all these verses on your mind, you're just thinking, well, it can't be that. It can't be the fact that I need works also to go to heaven because I have all this other stuff and I have this foundation that will not be moved. But if you, had the found, if you don't have that foundation, do you see how you can be like, well, it's got to be both then. It's got to work somehow in unity. Now, how about you, you first of all realize, oh, quite, well, that can't be the case. So, you know, you rule out that, and then you, you look at context. Well, in James chapter 2, verse 1, and actually the book of James in general is, it, brethren, my brethren is mentioned, is mentioned in every chapter. And so, who's he talking to? Is he talking to unsaved people? You know, he's talking to people that are saved. He's talking to people that are brothers. In verse uh, tw uh, 2, verse 1, how's the, how's the chapter start off? My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. 
That's how it starts off. He's saying, don't have faith in Jesus Christ with respect to persons. Meaning, you know, don't, don't respect the poor or the, the rich over the poor. And that's how he starts off this chapter. Then, when you find context, you read the whole chapter, what you're going to find out is that there's verses before that that might actually explain what's being said. So, we, were, we just read verse 14 and just ripped that out. Well, read verse 12. Verse 12 and verse 13. Read the two verses right before that and see if it will explain what's being said. And James chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. So what led into him saying, can faith save him? From what? Hell? No. That's not what's being talked about here. It's having judgment without mercy. Do you know that judgment must begin at the house of God? And if it began at us, if it first began at us, where should the ungodly and the sinner appear? You know, and it talks about the fact that, uh, that if the righteous scarcely be saved, or I'm sorry, it, it says, uh, and, what, and what shall be to those that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ? So it's saying that those that obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, judgment begins there. We're going to have a judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But in this life, we still have judgment. We still have condemnation if we're not walking in the light. And so this is talking about Christians being judged by the law of liberty. And it's saying that if you don't show mercy, you're going to have judgment without mercy. And you say, well, how does that fit? Uh, you didn't give to your brother when he needed? Isn't that what they give as an example? If you see your brother and sister, are we talking about unsaved people? No, we're talking about brethren. We're talking about those that are saved. And it says, if you see your brother or sister destitute and, and naked, or destitute and naked, and, uh, they, I'm misquoting it now. Uh, but basically it says uh, that, and you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? What are they talking about? Profiting your brother and sister in Christ. And if you don't do that, then you're going to have judgment without mercy because you showed no mercy. And so, just getting context... But first of all, you realize, okay, well, it can't be this, right? you got to rule out uh, the possibility. So when I go into a doctrine, okay, when I go into, a, a, let's say, a, a, a complicated doctrine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically compile every passage that I can think of that deals with that subject, and then I'm going to rule out what it can't be because of certain verses in the Bible. I'm going I'm to rule out, I'm going to have my foundational doctrines, but then I'm going to rule out what it can't be because it needs to all fit. It needs to all fit perfectly, right? It's a puzzle. And so if it's going to fit, then if there's something that I'm thinking it might be and it completely contradicts all these verses over here, that's out. And so basically you can have a list of like possibilities of what it's talking about and you rule out the possibilities that just can't apply because it contradicts Scripture. Then you can have like maybe one, two, or three possibilities doesn't contradict scripture and then you got to really hone in and see okay what is this talking about and so sometimes people have answers to passages that I don't agree with but it doesn't contradict scripture right that's fine that doesn't mean that's right you know what I mean and, and, and there's a lot of times people will uh, interpret a passage and their doctrines right right they're, they're preaching right because it's found in other places in the Bible but that passage isn't saying that Right? They're, 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 they're using a doctrine that's somewhere else in the Bible, and they think that that's what that passage is saying. So they're not preaching a wrong. They're not preaching a false doctrine. They're preaching a the right doctrine. It's just the passage isn't saying that doctrine. And so uh, James 2 is like that sometimes. You know, I have a certain interpretation. I believe it's talking about being the friend of God and being profitable as a Christian, and that God will judge us without mercy here in this life if we don't you know, help our brothers and sisters out. Um, but others would maybe say, well, this is more just talking about being justified before men and all that. Well, both of those are true. Right? The Bible teaches about how they're going to behold our good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know what I mean? Like, there's, there's truth to that. And so, uh, but you've got to rule out the stuff that is We know it's not that we can lose our salvation. We know it's not that we have to do good works too to go to heaven. And so you rule out that type of stuff. Uh, how about if you're studying baptism? Well, the first thing you have to, when you're going into this, okay, is you've got to realize, is there only one of these things that you're talking about? Because if you remember, I preached on baptism, and uh, if you go into this thinking it all applies to the same exact thing, or baptism's always talking about the same exact thing, you may have problems, right? Go to Hebrews chapter 6. 
And sometimes, you know, you'll actually have a verse that'll just help you to determine that. So I'm just trying to give you some ideas and just kind of let you in on how I study the Bible, you know, like what I do, how I, how I come up, you know, with what I believe and all this stuff and why I teach it. Because in the end, I don't want to just teach something that has holes in it, right? Maybe it's because I don't want to be embarrassed, you know, because, it, I mean, that's a big part of it, right? First of all, I don't want to, I don't want to lie to you even if it's not by you know choice you know like I, even if I, if I was to preach something and I'm like well I think this is right I don't want to take the chance that I'm telling you something wrong and then you follow that and then you believe that and you know I'm the one that led you into that even though that's not my intent um, I want to make sure that my daughter that, that when I preach something to you I don't see any holes in it and that when someone comes up to you they can't gainsay it you know, that's what you got to look at when you're doctoring. Is there a hole in it? Can they gainsay it? Can they say something that would contradict it? That it would be hard to answer, you know? And that's the type of stuff you're looking for in a doctrine. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Notice this, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Notice how that's the foundation. Of the doctrine of baptisms... Notice that, plural, right? Now, the oneness people, I don't know how they would answer this because they're always like, one baptism, right? No, actually, they were saying one spirit, one Lord, one God. It's one. It's only one spirit. Well, how do you answer one baptism in Ephesians 4 when it says the doctrine of baptisms? You know, you get that S in there, right? Because there's... there's there, there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and then there's the baptism of Jesus when he actually died and rose again from the dead. There's the water baptism. There's, there's different baptisms. Now, a lot of them represent the same thing, right? Water baptism represents what Jesus actually did. But then there was the baptism when they went under the Red Sea. Okay? So, if you go into it thinking all these baptisms are all the same, you're going to come out with some strange doctrines. Okay? So, all that to say is that sometimes the Bible will help you understand that and say, okay, well, there is more than one baptism. When it's talking about one baptism, it's talking about a particular baptism, right? When it's talking about the unity of the church, one spirit, one baptism, one faith, right? And so uh, the one baptism is talking about the particular baptism, you know, as far as Jesus' baptism or, you know, being water baptized into the church and you're all in unity, all that stuff, right? But... But I'll say this, when I go into a doctrine, when I go into, uh, you know, like, end times prophecy, right? You get into the weeds on, like, all the, the different things as far as the timelines and all this other stuff, right? Do you know what I do when I go into a doctrine? I try to destroy it. I try to dismantle it. And so I'll put out an idea, so to speak, and be like, well, I wonder if this is true. I wonder if this would fit, right? I try to destroy it. Now... That's what most people don't do. Most people go into a, into a doctrine and they'll say, they're trying to prop it up, right? And so they're just trying to find all the verses that fit it. And they're trying to pull out, oh, what will prop this up? What, what fits this, right? But then they, they won't look into, are there verses that go against it? So the pre-tribulation rapture is like that, right? Where it's just like, well, they have, you know, they'll look at these verses and then they're trying to prop it up with all this stuff. But they don't look at all the verses that would completely contradict it. And so if you want to have good doctrine, you want to have doctrine that's, that no one can gainsay, try to gainsay it. Try to destroy it. Try to find a blow that would just completely annihilate it. And you know what? There's been doctrines like that where I, I've looked at it and be like, you know, I wonder if this is true. And then I'll be like, no, nah, that can't be right. <laughs> right. Because I'll look at a verse and be like, no, nah, no, nah, that's not right. But what if I, it, it sounded good. You know, off the cuff, you're like, oh, that sounds good. You know, that sounds like that. That's a, that'd be a good truth. And then you find a verse, you're like, nah, nah. <laughs> that completely annihilates it. And so, why? You know, because there's going to be gainsayers. There's going to be attacks. Why not prove it? Prove it before you bring it out. And it's just like a war, right? When you go into a war with your weapon, which is the Word of God, you need to prove it. And before I come out with a, with a doctrine, especially a complicated doctrine, I'm going to prove that thing sure, right? When I go and shoot competition matches, you know what I want to do? I want to practice, I want to practice, I want to practice. I want to practice so much that you always want to practice to a higher level than what you even need to do, right? 
anytime you're going into some sport or some type of uh, event or something like that, you want to be higher as far as your abilities than what you even think is needed. Okay, so when I go into a doctor and I'm, I'm taking it to the level to where, you know, I'm like, there's just no way anybody can gain say this because I've tried to put every torpedo and every dart that I could into this thing and I pulled everything out here and trying to destroy this thing and it can't be destroyed, you know, from my knowledge, right? That doesn't mean that you still couldn't come out with a doctor and that someone could kind of gain say, right? But you want to you wanna use your arsenal and say, what can this thing be destroyed? And so that's the way you should go into it. Not trying to find some new thing and trying to come out and say, well, I found some new doctrine here. No, and especially, I'll say this, especially if it's something that you haven't heard preached. Okay? Because remember, there's nothing new under the sun. And if it's something that's, that's some new doctrine, you better put that thing through the fire before you bring it out. And so... You know that don't don't just have you know it's like the 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 Athenians they always wanted some new thing right or in First Corinthians chapter fourteen you know they they all have a hymn they have a psalm they have a revelation you know they all want some new thing to make them look and to separate them from everybody else and so when you're coming to your doctrine don't look at it that way no you just want to know what the truth is you want to know what the Bible says and you want to be able to defend it and so uh, go to Titus chapter uh, one Titus chapter one so. You know, why? Why study the Bible? Well, there's many reasons to study the Bible. Um, but I just want to give you tips on how I study it. How I come to conclusions on doctrines. Because I don't want to eat crow. Does that make sense? If that's enough for me right there. Now, obviously, I want to be right. And I want to be right with God. And I want to teach things that are right. But I don't want to eat crow. I don't want to come up here and be like, you know what, that whole sermon I preached over there was completely wrong, <laughs> okay? And you know what, if it happens, it happens, and, you know, I need to be humble enough to do that, right? But I don't want to do that, <laughs> okay? So therefore, when I come up here and preach something to you, I'm going to put it through the fire as much as I can to make sure that it, I'm not going to be eating crow later on and say that was completely out the window. That was completely in left field over there. Um, but Titus chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Why? That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are all way liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Why do you need sound doctrine? Why do you need to study the Bible? Because there's a bunch of deceivers and unruly, wicked people out there that are trying to deceive people. And you need to be able to have doctrine that they can't gainsay. You come up with some, you, you get the Bible and you get the truth of the Bible and you throw that at them, they'll be speechless. Because they won't be able to say anything against it. And so, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for your doctrine to be so sound that the gainsayers won't be able to say anything against it. They won't be able to gainsay it. What does it mean to gainsay it? Basically, they'll be able to say something against it. They'll be able to say, like, that doesn't work because of this, or this and, this and that. Uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse 1 it says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. And by the way, these are the pastoral epistles. So if you're a pastor, you need to have sound doctrine. That's the thing that's, that's coming up over and over again. Not a novice and having good, sound doctrine. But it's going to be coming from giving attendance to reading, having foundational doctrines that don't move, holding on to the Bible and the Word of God is that foundation. And also, not contradicting all these scriptures, not having doctrines that, that are just fall apart. And so, uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse 6, I still consider myself a young man, man, and so this is talking to young men here. So, it says, Young men, men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to save you. If you have good doctrine and sound speech, you're not going to be ashamed. 
And isn't that what it says? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a, a workman that needeth, or a, rightly dividing, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Why? Because you studied to show yourself approved unto God, and your doctrine sound. And you're not going to be ashamed. Obviously, if I had to come up here and eat crow for what I said or what I preached, that, I'm going to be ashamed of that, right? I'm not going to feel good about that. And so, you need to study to show yourself approved unto God and so that you're not ashamed when you preach that doctrine. And so, uh, you know, we need to, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4. And so, we need to be speaking. You know, when you give a doctrine, let me ask you a question. If you give a doctrine... And you're trying to explain a doctrine, and you're not pulling out Bible verses as you're saying that, then there's something wrong with your doctrine. If you're just using logic, Calvinists, dispensationalists, you know, all these people, it, it, you know, it's all logic, it's all like basically, you know, well, well, if God was this, then this, and this, and this, it's like, where's the Bible? And so, you need to have Bible. If you're going to speak about a doctrine, you better be pulling out the Bible. If you're going to convince me of a doctrine, if you're going to say, well, if you're going to come up to me and say, I don't agree with you on that doctrine, you better have the Bible at your right hand to prove to me that I'm wrong. Because if it's just your own logic, you know, I'm going to reject you out of hand. Because that means nothing to me. Men's wisdom and their philosophy, that doesn't match anything to what the Bible says. This is what's powerful. And if you're going to prove a doctrine to me, you better prove it from the Bible. And it better not contradict clear foundational doctrines. And if it does, if you come up to me and, and tell me that, you know, there's no trinity, I'm just going to, I'm going to reject it out of hand. I don't even need to look into that. Okay? If you're going to come up to me and say salvation is not by grace or that you, you can lose your salvation or it's not, you know, there's works involved, I'm going to reject it out of hand. That's a foundational doctrine. It doesn't move. It's not up for debate. Okay? And so, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, because, you know, why is it important to study the Bible? Why is it important to know how to study the Bible? So that you're not carried away with strange doctrines. So you're not tossed to and fro. Okay? There's nothing wrong with switching on a doctrine if it's right. But you don't want to be back and forth. You know, be like, one day I'm over here, one day I'm over here. One day I'm over here, and one day I'm over here. Because you're, you're reading different books of the Bible, and you're just like, well, over here it kind of sounds like it's saying this, over here it says this. You're, you're not stable. and uh, You know, that's... That's what you need as far as a teacher of the Bible. You need someone that's stable, that's, that's sound, and that they're not, they're not moving back and forth, right? They're not a, we, uh, a reed shaking in the wind, right? When you're talking about John the Baptist and a good prophet, he said, he's not a reed shaking in the wind. He's not just going back and forth between things. And so, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, it says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is good, a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. And so, the Bible talks about not being carried away with that. And then also in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And this modalism stuff, listen to me now, this modalism stuff is a bunch of craftiness. It's a bunch of cunning craftiness. The Calvinism stuff is a bunch of cunning craftiness. This dispensationalism stuff is a bunch of cunning craftiness. And it's just doctrines to move you to and fro to get away from the Bible. And it's a bunch of philosophy and logic. And it's not biblical. That's right. You know, the modalists can't give you one verse where it says Jesus is the Father. Not one. They can't give you one verse. It's always, well, if this, then this. And because this, that means Jesus is the Father. You know, the Calvinists can't show you one verse where it says perseverance of the saints or limited atonement or any of their stupid tulip doctrine. The dispensationalists can't show you one verse where someone was saved by works in the Old Testament. Or that it's going to be that way in the New Testament or in, in the, the millennial reign. They can't show you one verse. It's all logic. It's all cunning craftiness. And unless you get rooted and grounded in the Word of God by studying to show yourself approved unto God, you're going to be carried away into that. And so you need to study the Bible. But remember to, to, have, to have that reading there in the forefront. Okay? Um, and, and obviously... You need to be in a church where the pastor's not going to and fro. He's not just looking for some new thing. 
Listen, I preached to you a lot of sermons in this past year. Were any of them just like some new thing where you're just like, man, I've never heard, you know? You may say, well, that's a new way of understanding, you know, a new way of maybe uh, uh, figuring out what it's talking about. But it wasn't a new doctrine, right? It's not like this was some new thing where you're just like, oh, Mountain Baptist Church has this doctrine no one else has. No, it's been the same since the foundation of the world. I listened to a guy who's not our stripe, I'm sure, but he preached uh, a sermon on BBN, like this, this thing on BBN. He's an older guy. Um, and he befriended me on Facebook, and I was kind of a little bit leery of it because, you know, he's like a president of a Baptist college in Florida, right? And, uh, and he posted this sermon where he was preaching to a whole bunch of people, and it was online and all this stuff. And, uh, and it, was all about, it was all about grace. It was like a grace conference or something like that, right? And I listened to it, and uh, he starts off, and he's talking about how we're saved by grace, not by works. And I'm just waiting for something to be wrong in this sermon, right? I'm waiting for, for something to be out of line. He preached that eternal security was the gospel. And that if you don't believe in, if you believe you can lose your salvation, you're not saved because you're not trusting in Jesus alone. He preached that the new man, when it says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. He, he rebuked people that said in the Greek, it says this is a continual sin. And he said this is talking about the new man, the spirit that doesn't sin, and the old man that does sin, and you have to choose to go between them. And I was just like, I was like, where was this guy at? You know? But here's the thing, it's not new. It's not new. When I went through that whole First John series, and I just got done preaching that, right? And I just got done preaching that, and, and you may say, man, I never really heard that, like, explained like that. Or, you know, that makes, you know, you may say, well, that makes sense. You know, why haven't I never heard that? Listen, that's been going on. That's been preached before. 100 years ago, that was preached. 200 years ago, that was preached. 1,000 years ago, that was preached because that's what the Word of God says. And that just proves and validates that we're not alone, and that is not some new doctrine there. There's a guy that actually believed the Bible and is holding to his beliefs and holding to the Word of God. He was rebuking all these new versions out there that corrupt the King James, and he's on BBN, which uses every version in the Bible, or every version that's out there. And, and he was rebuking them. He's like, you may not like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. And I'm like, man, how did he get his spots preaching there? But I was waiting. I was like trying to find something to where I shouldn't like this video, right? I'm just like, and I didn't want to be that way. But, you know, when you have people that are kind of mainstream or, you know, they're in these Bible colleges and all that stuff, you're just waiting for them to say something really stupid. And he got into that, and he was talking about the being born of God does not commit sin. I'm like, here we go. He's going to say something off here. No, it was like exactly what I believe. It's exactly what the Bible teaches. And I'm like, wow, about time, right? But you know what that shows you is that this isn't new. You know, the post-tribulation rapture isn't new. You know, the person that wrote, it is well with my soul understood, that when the, the clouds depart as a scroll, when heaven's rolled up as a scroll, that's when the Lord's going to descend, and that happens in Revelation chapter 6. Amen. When that says that, right? That guy knew the post-tribulation rapture. That, the the pre-tribulation rapture didn't come around until the 1800s. And obviously, I'm sure there was some stupid false doctrine back before that. But all that to say is that this isn't new. This isn't some new doctrine. But we need to have the foundation sure. We need to have that sure. Read your Bible. Memorize the Bible. When you go into your Bible study... You know, then you're going to have this rock to, to kind of work off of. Okay, you don't just go into it and be like, well, everything's up for grabs. Let's figure this out. No, you need to have a foundation before you go into it. And, you know, then you're not going to get tossed to and fro. And have a good church, too, where you're going to be preaching, where you're going to hear the, the word preached and someone that's studying the Bible to where it'll kind of keep you in line. If you're, if you're, you're kind of getting uh, deceived by some of these people and then you come to church and you have, you have a preacher that's standing on the Word of God, you know, that, that will kind of keep you in line on that type of stuff. So all that stuff helps, right? But let's end with a word prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and I pray that you'd uh, be with us as we go out soul winning and with the fellowship as well. Lord, we thank you for this church. Thank you for everybody here. Thank you for the spirit of this church that just wants to hear your word preached and that loves your word. And Lord, we just uh, pray that again that you be with us. Give us safe travels. And we love you and pray all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.